Just remember that you are the light of the world and the salt of the earth. And there are going to come things that you're going to come against. But remember, greater is he that is in you and you and you and you than he is in the world. There's going to be things that you're going to come up against. But you have the greater thing inside of you. And if you don't, you need it. So let's pray. Father God, I thank you, God, for every student here, God. God, I pray that you would go before them, God. God, that you would open their hearts, God, to be a light, God, in that school, whatever school they go to, God. And God, I pray that you will send Jonathan friends, God, to come along beside them, God, and to be light in a dark place sometimes. God, there are good and there's evil all over this world. But God, I pray that you would be with each of them, God. God, I pray that you would give them wisdom, God, that you would give them understanding. God. And God, what more importantly, God, that you would under, let them understand that their teachers love them. Lord, sometimes we do things they don't like. But God, we're there for a purpose. And God, I pray for the teachers, God, that you would give us love. That you would give us compassion, Father God. That you would give us wisdom, God. That you would give us revelation, God, to see what each individual student's needs are, Father. God, speak through us what they need, God. Help us to call fears, God, and to teach them to be who they need to be. God, help the students to be bold, but God, also help us to be bold, God, in what we teach and how we act. Help us to be a light in this dark world. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, 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 amen. Okay, you guys can stand back up and and this week and next week as the kids are going back to school, just lift them up in prayer. When you wake up, just say touch them because the devil has formed the, the, formed the weapons. And they are in our kids' schools. But we know that God's promise is that it will not prosper. We are children of the King. We are daughters and sons of the King. And He will take care of us. Amen. So you guys keep these kids and these teachers in prayer as they go and start a new year. Are you ready to continue worship this year? Amen. Worship with us.
story you tell this morning, church. Amen. And the children can be released for Kids Church. And I would like, you guys can be seated, and I would like to welcome Bishop Mike White to the stage to bring the word of the Lord. Let's give him a hand clap of appreciation this morning. Well, good morning, Book Chapel. Round two. It's so good to be with you today, and I want to take just a moment to thank Pastor Brian Raven for allowing me to be here today to bring the word to you. This is not the first time. I've been here a number of times, and it's so good to be back. I was sharing with the congregation this morning of how I was reminiscing this week of the journey of this church. I was, I called Pastor Brian and asked him, I said, how long has the church in its existence. I was thinking 11, 12 years, and he told me it's 16. But I remember the journey of this church from your beginnings. I remember you being in temporary locations, having to set up and break down and move around and finally got to this location and the blessing of the Lord to be here and how the, the Lord moved you forward with a daycare. It's been a great progress. And now two services with two beautiful congregations on Sunday morning, three services have an Hispanic service on Thursday afternoon, and man, the Lord has blessed you. And if there's ever been a church that I felt like needed to be in a building program, this is it. And I commend you on the wonderful, wonderful journey that you've been on. I commend you on the visionary leadership that this church has had. Would you give your church leadership a hand of appreciation for all the days of your Now, before I have you stand and read the word, I understand that we're going to be live streaming right now, so uh, I want to be very quick about this. Let me just tell you, I told this to the early congregation, and it didn't happen. Praise God. But uh, about a week and a half ago, I started uh, coughing. And uh, now understand, I am CDC approved. I'm a card-carrying member of the vaccinated, whether you like it or not. I've been vaccinated, so I'm CDC approved. I do everything right. But about a week and a half ago, I got the coughing and got a little bit worried. I couldn't get through a morning message I was doing for coughing so bad. So I went and got tested. And you know what they told me? They said I had something other than COVID. So I was really pleased with that, kind of surprised. I thought everything was COVID these days. But I just had the common ordinary bronchitis. And uh, I'm still getting over the cough. So if I get the coughing... Don't get alarmed. Don't get worried. Don't run for the doors. You can't get it. It's okay. You know, don't give me that look, you know, and throw stuff at me. We'll be okay. Would you stand with me this morning for the reading of God's Word? I still this morning, I got the coughing last week, preaching, and it just worried my wife to death, embarrassed her to death, and I coughed through it and finally had just basically had to give it up, you know. Uh, and she was said, Mike, you scared them people to death. So after I got tested, I called the pastor and said, would you get word out to your people that I didn't have COVID? You know, just let them know everything's all right. So, so we're good. If you have your Bibles, I want to preach to you today from one verse of Scripture. And it's going to be an expository message from one verse of Scripture. Rarely do you hear an expository message from one verse. But we're going to do that today from Revelation chapter 22 and verse 20, the next to the last verse of the Bible. And I believe the Lord would have me talk to you today about the coming of the Lord. I am excited about the time in which we're living. I am encouraged about the time in which we're living because I realize that we're standing right next to the coming of Jesus Christ for his church. And I'm ready. I'm ready for his appearance. If you're ready for the appearance of the Lord, why don't you give him a clap off and a prayer? Amen. Amen. Hey, might be better than an amen. <laughs> That's West Virginia. There you go. Hey. At least you're not from Arkansas. We're okay. Amen. Arkansas, you're probably a little pig, so we don't want that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for all my Arkansas friends. Revelation chapter 22, verse 20. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. And then the revelator responded, Amen. 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 Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Yes, Let's look at it again. I want you to really get this verse, in, this, this verse in your spirit today. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. 
And the revelator responded, Amen. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. Yeah. Father, I come before you today in the name of Jesus. And I thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to stand and to break the bread of life to this congregation again. I ask you, Father, in the coming moments that you had touched me to speak the word in the power of the demonstration of the Holy Ghost, for I do not care to speak with enticing words of men's wisdom. I ask you, Father, that every word that is spoken, nothing more, nothing less, would be sent from heaven's altar. I ask you, Lord, that you would open the hearts and the ears of each one that is here, that they would receive the word of God with meekness, and that the word would be as a seed sown upon a prepared ground that indeed we would experience a harvest. I pray for the building of faith, the building of hope, and I pray, Father, where necessary, the conviction of sin. And I ask you, Father, when we leave this place today, that that which you have designed for this service will have been accomplished. It's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. Amen. And amen. Would you say praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. You may be seated. Back in... April of 2020, just about a year and a half ago, as, and I'm going to get away from COVID and talk as quick as I can, but as COVID was ramping up and the news was getting bleaker and bleaker and more and more people were getting sick and hospitalized and the government, state governments began to shut down churches and shut down restaurants and all the things that was going on and the reports were very bleak. I began to worry about the churches that are under my charge and the pastors that were under my charge. You see, I'm the bishop of a, of a mission region. We have 33 churches, and the vast majority of those churches run less than 50. Eighty percent of my pastors are bivocational or co-vocational. They have to work to make it. A lot of them actually pay their churches to a pastor, believe it or not. But I remember that as all of this was happening, I began to worry about those pastors of the churches because the vast majority of them had no social media outreach. They had not, never operated with online services. They had no other method of giving into the local churches. And I was really concerned that a number of my pastors financially would not make it, that they would, might would give up. I was concerned that some of the churches might not make it through. And I remember I was, I was very worried but I came back to Carolina during that time, and uh, you know you, you know you're in trouble when you get on American Airlines, and there's only 10 people on the whole flight. And uh, I asked them, can I change seats? She looked around, and she said, any one of you all. And uh, so things were getting kind of dire. Now, I remember being here in Carolina during the time, and I was concerned. I had a lot of anxiety about what was going on. And... As I was waking up one morning, and I'm not quite sure if I was awake yet, if I was dreaming or in, a, or in kind of like a dream-like state, but I remember over and over in my spirit as I was waking up, my eyes weren't even open. I, I kept hearing this verse of Scripture. I kept hearing it again and again, Jesus saying, surely I'm coming quickly. And I would hear the words of the Revelator, amen, even so come, Lord Jesus. And I don't know how long it went on, but I remember eventually waking up and these words still being so strong on my mind. Surely I'm coming quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. And I was so moved by the way that I woke up that morning that I, I went down to my study at the house and opened my Bible to the verse of Scripture and I just read it over and again, which I, I read it so many times. And I asked the Lord, just began to speak to me, Lord, what is it that you're trying to say to me? In this, in this verse of scripture. And as I sat there literally for hours reading that verse of scripture, meditating, praying with the Lord, the Lord began to, to speak some things to me. And even though I had woke up feeling very encouraged that morning because of the word of the Lord being in my spirit, it was quite apparent to me still that though I was encouraged by what was taking place in my spirit, that we were still living in very desperate times in the world. And I want you to understand that these are desperate times. But let me just share this with you. Desperate times did not begin in February of 2020 when word of COVID got out. I want you to understand that long before that, 
that we have been living in desperate times in the world and desperate times even in the United States. Maybe it took COVID to bring it to the forefront of people's minds to realize this, that we are living in the last days. And we come to understand that in the last days that many would depart from the faith, that in the last days that perilous times will come. And so I want you to understand today that, that even before COVID, and now that we're, we're hoping that we get post-COVID, I want you to understand that in the world that we are living in desperate times. We're living in times where, when that which is called, which is good is called evil, and that which is evil is called good. We, we're living in times of anarchy and fascism and, and, and the rising howl of socialism, uh, in, even in the United United States. We're, we're living a time where the people say it was a peaceful march and yet buildings were burned down and people are, are being beaten. We're living in desperate times in the world today. But I want you to understand that even though these are desperate times, let us not view them outside of the lens of the Bible. Because the times in which we're living, we really need to understand are biblical times. There is nothing that is taking place in the world today that is out of the scope of God's Word. There is nothing taking place in the world today that is out of the scope of the control of God's hand. God knew what would happen from the beginning. God knows what's going on in the middle. And God knows what the ultimate outcome will be. And so we're living in biblical times. The Word of God speaks to us and tells us about the days that we're living in that He would not have us ignorant concerning the times and the seasons that we're living in. So brothers and sisters, what I want you to understand today is even though that there are many people living in this world filled with anxiety and fear and worry, that we as the people of God ought not to live in that way. That ought not be our mindset. But we need to live knowing this, that everything that is taking place in the world today is foretold in the Word of God. And even though governments and powers and authorities... They don't seem to know what's going on. And it seems like they give conflicting opinions and direction. Understand this. There is no conflict in Almighty God. And we need to realize that we are standing on the threshold of the greatest event in history. And that is the return of Jesus Christ for His church. Can you say amen? So when we look at these days, let's let us as the people of God understand that we are living in the Bible. We are right where we need to be. But not only are these biblical days, these are redefining days. These are days which redefine our faith. These are days which, which redefine who is of the faith and who is not of the faith. It's days that redefine the church. You see, I've got news for you. That, you know, when, when all of this began over a year and a half ago, we had a lot more people going to church in the United States. We had a lot more people going to church in, in Church of God congregations. Demographers tell us that, that right now, probably 60 to 70% of people have returned back to church that were attending pre-COVID. Now that may not be true here, but, but across the board, that seems to be the trend, 60 to 70%. But I look back and I say, okay, if this is the case, but back then we had more people, then obviously, now, now some might fall out of the hearse with me on this one. Obviously, we had a lot of people that were just coming to church because they just enjoyed the music or because they enjoyed the fellowship. Or because they were enjoying the programs. But they weren't necessarily coming to church because they were in love with and sold out to Jesus Christ. So it has been a redefining time. There are people today who are no longer fearful of COVID. It's just that they got out of the habit and practice of going to church. They got in the habit and practice of staying home or going anywhere other than church. And they've not come back to the house of God yet. You see, what I want you to understand, it is times of conflict, not times of abundance. 
It is times of chaos, not times of abundance, that will cause our faith to be defined. And I praise God today that in the midst of everything that's going on, that there is a people in the house of God whose faith has been refined as though by fire. They're not just hangers on. They're not just lovers of the program. They're not just attending because mom and dad are there. But they're people that have their mind made up. I am going to serve the Lord. I am in love with Jesus Christ. Just say the Lord and just by chance that there's people out there that have walked by me this morning on, on live stream, let me just throw this out there to you. You might be in immunity compromised and need to stay at home. But if you're just sitting home in the, in the comfort of your own home and just saying, well, I don't have to go to church because this can be my church. Let me just say to those of that mindset today that the word of God still says not to forsake the assembly of ourselves together. I want everyone to understand this is not a day to give in to fear and anxiety. This is not a day to decide I want to find a way to stay out of church, but you can go to any restaurant. I want you to understand that this is a day for us to look for every opportunity to sit under the preaching of God's Word. This is an opportunity for us to gather and pray. We need to look for opportunity to strengthen the faith of our brothers and sisters. Let us define our faith by being a people in love with Jesus Christ. Would you say amen? amen. So these are biblical times. They're redefining times, but let me tell you what's going on today in the world. What's going on in the world today is the same thing that was going on in the book of Revelation for which I took my text. Now, I know there's a lot of people that when you say, I'm going to preach from the book of Revelation or I'm going to teach from the book of Revelation, they get a little bit nervous. Because, you know, to most folks, you know, they hear, all the, they hear about all the beasties and the ugly things in the book of Revelation, you know, and they can't really understand what's going on. They get a little fearful. I, don't, I, don't, I really don't understand Revelation. I'll stay away from it. Well, no. Revelation can be understood because it boils down to one question. Revelation boils down to one question. And, and it's the same question that's in the world today. Here it is. If you want to understand the book of Revelation, this is the question. Who is going to sit on the throne? And that's the whole question of the book of Revelation. Who is going to sit on the throne? And that's what's going on in the world today. That's the spirit. That's the question that the spirits are asking in the world today. Who is going to rule and reign on the throne of your heart? Who's going to rule and reign in your life? Who is going to rule and reign in your church? Now, I'm one of those people that if I get to read the book and it gets a little slow for me, I'll skip over to the very end of the book. And I'll read the last chapter. And if I like the last chapter, then I'll go back and read all the stuff in the middle. And so I want you to understand what I did is I skipped to the back of the book. And I went and I read in Revelation 22 and 20 where Jesus said, Surely I am coming quickly. And when I read that next to the last verse of the Bible, I realized the question is settled. It's all over. Jesus is going to sit on the throne. Jesus is going to rule in authority. Jesus is going to come again. And so all of this other stuff, it really doesn't matter. The devil may push. The devil may pull. People may come. People may go. But at the end of the day, it's settled. Jesus is going to sit on the throne. And I... I decided long ago to let him rule on the throne of my heart. Would you say amen? Yes. Revelation 22, 20. Jesus said, surely. Now I want you to keep your Bible open. I want you to look at this. Surely I am coming quickly. And when Jesus said surely, that wasn't just a filler word. But that word surely is an important word because it says, I give you this guarantee. I am giving you this as a promise. I am giving you this as my word that I am coming. It is a guarantee straight from the mouth of Jesus Christ. Now, when I'm here and something 
something breaks on my car. Or something breaks in my home and I need a repair person. Believe me, I need a repair person. I don't do stuff like that myself. But I want to carry my car to someone that's going to stand behind their work. I want to know, what's your guarantee? And if they can give me a guarantee that they'll stand behind their work, then I'll let them work on my car. But now understand this. If they tell me they give me a guarantee, they're going to stand behind their work. If I drive off that lot and that car's not right and I come back and they say, well, I don't know what's going on. You're still going to pay for more to be done. I call the liar because they don't stand behind their work. A guarantee means I stand behind my word. My word is true. I want you to understand about the Lord Jesus Christ. The grass withers and the flower fades away, but His Word will stand forever. Jesus said of Himself, All power and authority is given to me in heaven and in earth. His Word cannot fail. When the officers of the temple were sent out by the scribes, by the elder Pharisees, they went out to follow after Jesus to listen to every word he said because they wanted to find something wrong with his teaching. They wanted to catch him in a lie. But when they came back to report to the chief, they said, what did he say? And they said, never has a man spoken like this man. When this man speaks, he speaks with a voice of absolute divine authority. And what that means is when Jesus speaks, all of the power of Almighty God goes into action to make sure it will be just as Jesus said it would be. And so when Jesus said, surely, that means that it is unbreakable. Surely, I am coming quickly. Amen. Friends, I want you to know Jesus is coming again. Three times in Revelation chapter 22, in verse number 7, he says, I am coming quickly. In verse number 12, he said, I am coming quickly. In verse number 20, he said, I am coming quickly. Quickly, Over and again, Jesus said, I am coming. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52 says it like this. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trump of God shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. He is coming again. Matthew 24, 44 says it like this. And therefore, be ye also ready, for in an hour that you think not, not the Son of Man coming. Would somebody say amen? Amen. Oh, he's coming again. But who's he coming for? Who's he coming for? I look over at Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. And Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28 tells us that he is coming for them that are looking for him. Another translation said he is coming for them that are eagerly waiting on him. I've got to ask you today, are you looking for the coming of Jesus Christ? Are you eagerly anticipating the coming of Jesus Christ? Now let me tell you what happens so many times in churches. If a preacher gets up and asks that question, if they'll respond at all, says, usually the folks my age or older will say, yes, say, man, I'm looking for the good Lord to come. Because we're kind of getting sick of this. And usually it's the younger folks, pre-40, maybe even pre-50, that you ask that question, they go, uh, I don't really know. And the reason why is because they think, well, I've got a little bit more I'd like to do. I've got a little bit more that I'd like to see. I've got a little bit more that I'd like to accomplish. Friend, I've got news for you. If you call yourself a Christian and you're not looking for the return of Jesus Christ, if you're not eagerly anticipating the coming of Jesus Christ, then you've gotten too settled here and you don't realize what God has prepared for us because there is nothing to see here. There is nothing to do here that compares to the glory that awaits us when we come into the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Surely I am coming quickly. Yeah. Even so come. Amen. That's what the revelator said. Amen. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Yes. Us preachers love amen. amen. We love amen 
ain't better if a child loves candy. You say amen to a preacher, it's like throwing gas on a fire, son. We're ready to roll. Amen! Oh, yeah. I've heard preachers preach on that word amen. It means so be it. In other words, it means I am in agreement amen. with what you're saying, Lord. Yeah. I am in agreement that he is coming quickly. But it has another dimension that we don't talk about. And the dimension that we don't talk about is I anticipate it. My brothers and my sisters, I anticipate the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. I realize that every morning when I wake up or every night when I lay my head to rest, that it could be during that time frame that the Lord Jesus Christ comes again. I've come here this morning to kind of shake you. I've come here this morning to kind of wake you up. I've come here this morning to help you realize that we need to be a people that are not so earthbound, but that we are a people eagerly anticipating the world and the life that is yet to come. Because whether we say we're ready or we want to wait, we don't get to determine the time of the return of Jesus Christ. We must be ready at all times. And I anticipate the return of the Lord. Even so come, Lord Jesus. Yes, amen. I can just hear the longing in his heart. Thank you, Lord. Even so come, Lord Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. You know, when I hear him say that, I hear him say, Lord... I don't want to be out of your presence. Amen. Lord, I don't want to spend another day out of your physical presence. Yeah. I don't want to spend another day without seeing you face to face and walking with you. Oh, right now we walk by faith, not by sight. Right now we walk with him because God is a spirit. And we walk with him in the spirit. We literally walk with him, but we don't see him. We don't visualize him with our eyes. We don't hear him with our ears audibly. But the revelator is saying, Lord, I want to be in your physical presence. I want to be able to reach out and touch you. I want to audibly hear you. I want my eyes to fall upon your face. I want to be in your presence. How, how? Can we ever say, I love you, Lord, if we're willing not to be with him? Amen. How can we ever say, I love you, Lord, if, if we don't want to be in his physical presence? Amen. My Lord, I, I can imagine what Miss Sonia would say if I looked at her and said, I love you, but I don't care if I live with you. <laughs> Miss Sonia wouldn't like that too. I can only imagine what, what Miss Sonia would say if I say, I love you, but I never wanted to look at her eyes. Or if I said, I love you, but I never wanted to take her by the hand. Isn't it amazing how that, how that we can say, I love you, Lord, without that longing for that physical contact, that physical presence with the Lord. Oh, I believe that's what the revelator was saying. Even so, come Lord Jesus. I, I don't want to be here without you. I, I want to be in your physical presence. Oh, help us fall so deeply in love with Him. We're homesick for Him. Oh, I better go on. I can just, I can middle right there, but I'm not going to. I read that morning, like I said, I spent hours in my study that morning. And the Lord just did a job in my heart with that verse of Scripture. He encouraged me. He blessed me. He helped me. He, he spoke things to me about my own anticipation of His coming. And, and by the time He was through with me that day, there was three things that I realized that, 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 that was here for all believers. And I'm quickly going to give you those three things. But before God finished with me that day, He told me, He, he let me know, Mike... This is the hope of my people. Amen. This is the hope of my people. That I am coming again. Yes, yes. If my people will get a hold of this, they will live. And their spirits will be secure. You see, this promise of what is to come, that Jesus is coming, it keeps my mind secure now. Now, I've got to tell you, 
before that morning, I was going through a period that where my mind was not very secure. Because I was, I, I was, I was anxious. I was worried. What, what's going to happen to my pastors? What's, what's going to happen to, to the churches? I, I was wondering. I, wor I was worried. If the churches fold, do they need an overseer? I was concerned. I was worried. I was, I was having anxiety about how are we going to navigate these days? How is this going to go on? And, and by the time it was over that day, the Lord had given me peace. And the Lord had told me, this is your hope. Can I tell you something? I had a battle going on here. And can I tell you, that's the greatest battleground in your life. Amen. It's what is going on in your mind. And the Bible tells us, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. In other words, we as believers are to practice the mind of Christ. But the problem is, is, is when we allow ourselves to be filled with fear and anxiety and worry, when all we do is sit around and slurp up the negatives that we're hearing on the news, we're not practicing the mind of Christ, but in reality, we're practicing the mind of Antichrist, which allows him to set up his rule in this world. But he said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. So how, how do we practice the mind of Christ? We practice the mind of Christ. We have fit by filling with hope by bringing our thoughts into captivity. In other words, when we begin to think more in, in terms of fear and anxiety and worry, when we begin to question what's going to happen tomorrow and, and dread what's going to happen next week, we've got to bring those thoughts into captivity. We've got to say, I'm not going to be a man or I'm not going to be a woman that lets my mind stay there. That's not the plan of God. But we have to arrest those things very early and say, I'm going to fill my mind with the Word of God. In other words, we fill our mind with truth. And my brothers and my sisters, if we fill our lives with fear and dread and anxiety, it brings you into bondage. But if we fill our minds with truth, what does the truth do? It sets you free. If you want to have freedom in your life, freedom in your mind, practice the truth of God's Word. We've got to connect with godly associates. Oh, that's why people need to gather together in the house of God. We need to connect with godly associates because if all we're connecting with is people that are speaking fear and speaking anxiety and speaking worry, it's going to bring us down. You know, there's been a few people in my life I've had to cut out of my life. There's been a few people in my life that when they spoke to me, oh, they, you know, I, I was never encouraged. I had to look at a staff member one time when I was pastoring and say, stop. Every time you walk in my office, it's negative. Every time you walk in my office, you bring me down. I'm not going to let you speak in my life anymore. Stop. Don't ever do it again. I fired him soon after that. There's some people you've got to cut out of your life because they're going to feed you all the negative. You need to fill your life with godly associates that will encourage you and help you. You need to be filled your life with godly associates that you can be accountable to, testify to one another, encourage one another. And brothers and sisters, instead of sitting in front of the television and letting NBC, ABC, CNN, or Fox News be your minister, my Lord, cut it off and go get into the prayer closet and get into the intimate presence of Almighty God. Pray in the Holy Ghost. And when you come out of that prayer closet, you're going to find that you have that sense of security and peace that comes from God. The Word of God said in Isaiah 26 and 30, You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. Let us be a people who follow Philippians 4 and 8. Whatsoever things are good, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely and of a good report, think on these things. That is our hope. Yeah. Jesus is coming. Fill your heart. Fill your mind with these things. But can I tell you something? The hope that he gives us is not just a hope to cope. You know, that, that, that actually right there was Tweedle. That's 
Facebook worthy right there. Man, I tell you, you're official when you get Facebook worthy. The hope of Jesus is not just hope to cope, but it is more. You see, the hope of Jesus Christ, the hope that he gives us, just doesn't cope with what's going on. But it gives us a sense of security because we know what is to come. If in this life only we had hope, we would of all men be most miserable. Thank God my hope is not just here, but my hope is in the hereafter. I know that there is more to come because Jesus said so. When Jesus sat with his disciples in that upper room just prior to his passion, he looked at them and he said to them, I, I, I'm not going to do this any longer with you here. He said, but the next time I sup with you, it's going to be in my Father's kingdom. In other words, he's saying, we're going to gather again. We're going to gather at the table. It's not going to be in this world. It will be in the world to come. My brothers and sisters, he's talking about the marriage supper of the Lamb. And there is coming a day when the bride of Christ, we are going to gather at the marriage supper and we will sup in the presence, the physical presence of our Lord and we will forever be with Him. Would you give the Lord a cup of the bread? Not only is that verse our hope, but that verse needs to be our prayer. Even so come, Lord Jesus. Boy, that's a tough prayer for some people to pray. I mean, really, seriously. I'm just going to ask you, don't, don't raise your head or talk because I don't want people to feel bad towards you. But have you ever prayed, even so come, Lord Jesus? Like I said, those of us get a few years almost, we tend to do that sometimes. But you know, when I was a younger man, I don't remember praying even so come, Lord Jesus. When I was a younger man, there's a whole lot of things I wanted to do, a whole lot of things I wanted to see. My Lord, I'm about to be a preacher. Now, ain't that stupid for a preacher to say, I've got to be a preacher when he can go to heaven. <laughs> but that's, that's my I got a lot of people to win to Jesus. I got a lot of preaching to do. I got a lot of ministry to do. So you wait to come back. Even so come Lord Jesus. The problem is that we got a lot of people saying, yeah, they might not say it out loud, but their attitude is, is, could you wait a little longer, sweet Jesus? I'm not quite ready yet. But my brothers and my sisters, we live in a world, if we understand the Bible right in the last days, that apostasy would come. That there would be a departure from the faith. If we understand that in the last days, even the righteous are scarcely being saved, wouldn't it make sense that we, instead of saying, wait a little bit longer, that we're saying, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus, Lord, I want to see you, Lord. I want to be in your presence. But the problem is, is too many in the church have put down roots. As if this world is home. And we've gotten such adjusted to it that we say, well, it's really not that bad of a place. Yeah, there's stuff going on, and if I watch the news, I, I get bothered by it. But you know, if I turn the TV off and put my blinds down, if I don't go to the grocery store and listen to the radio, I can kind of sit around here and I'm, I'm doing all right. I can order my groceries online now, I don't have to get out there, everything's all right. It's not so bad being in this world after all. And that's, the problem is, is when you're not homesick for heaven and you're adjusted to this world, it's, it's really a conflict of interest in the Christian faith. You see, here, here's the problem. Is, is we get adjusted to the dark and we say, I'm all right yet. I told him in the first service, I'll, I'll tell you again. And I have to be careful talking about this. My wife's around. She gets on to me. So I don't know what to tell her. I don't need help. But I've reached that age now where the, a couple of times a night I have to get up. Now you older guys, y'all understand what I'm talking about. You young guys ain't got an idea, ain't got a clue in the world. And I have to be careful because sometimes I'm here in my home in North Carolina. Sometimes I'm in my home in Falmouth, Maine. And a lot of times I'm on the road and I'm in a hotel somewhere. And sometimes I look at the middle and I say, Lord God, where am I right now? What, what town am I in right now? 
But when I wake up and I have to go to the restroom, if I jump up immediately, I am going to hit my toes on something, and that stresses my sanctification. So I don't want to do that. Or I'm going to trip over something that I've left laying in the floor. Or I'm going to run into a wall. But I've learned if I'll just lay there just a little bit that my pupils will dilate. And it'll let the light come in from every source there is to get it. And before long, my eyes adjust and I can see around that room. Now, I'm not seeing perfectly. But I can see shadows and I can see objects and I can walk around things and I can walk past walls and I can step over things. I can do pretty good because I'm adjusted to the dark. But here's the thing. Being adjusted to the dark is not the same thing as walking in the light. Amen. And we've got a lot of people that are adjusted to the light, adjusted to the dark, but they're not walking in the light. You see, when we walk in the light, it, it, it makes us different. When we walk in the light, we want to live circumspectly. When we walk in the light, we don't want to let this world spot us. We don't want to let this world defile us. When we walk in the light, we don't want to fall into the pitfalls of the traps of the devil. When we walk in the light, we can see clearly the path that is righteous. And we walk in a righteous path. But we, but we were just adjusted to the dark. We're just feeling our way through. And there's going to be pitfalls we're going to fall in. And there's going to be traps that we're going to hit. May God help us to have that prayer even so. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Let me walk in the light. Let me live in the light, Lord. I am ready to see you. Amen. I look at Hebrews chapter 11. And over about verse number 10. It begins to speak specifically about Abraham. And it says of Abraham that he was looking for a city that had foundations, whose builder and maker was God. I want you to understand this. We too are looking for another city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. I am looking for, I am anticipating my journey. I am anticipating making it to heaven. Jesus said to us, occupy till I come. We have a purpose to be here. We are occupied. That word occupy is a military term. It means you're going somewhere for a temporary occupation. And while you're in that temporary occupation, you are to operate by a different law than the land you're in. You are governed by a different authority than the land you're in. You have a specific appointment in that land, but you know that you're going back to the land from which you came. Jesus said, Occupy till I come. In other words, seek and save to seek to save the lost until I come. Do the work of the kingdom till I come. But brothers and sisters, it was never intended that this world would be our home. Our home is a heavenly home. And I want you to understand that at the sound of the trumpet, our occupation comes to an end. It is our hope. It is our prayer. And finally, I want you to understand that it is our absolute promise from the Lord. I am coming quickly. In John 14, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Amen. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And then I will come again. When I hear that promise, that, that guarantee from the Lord. He said, I promise you a place. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I'm going to prepare a place for you. You know, I get amazed at people sometimes who say, oh, just get a little cabin on the hillside of heaven. My Lord, they're underestimating the Lord. Because the Lord speaks in terms of mansions. Yeah. I don't know what mine's going to look like, but I know it's there. Amen. Because he said, I go to prepare. There is a mansion there for me. You know, sometimes I look out at congregations and 
I know the majority of the people that are sitting in the congregation are followers of Jesus Christ are Christians. I know that most of the time. I know most of the time I'm preaching to the choir and just encouraging the believers. But just in case somebody came in here today and you're not assured of your salvation, you don't know, you have not made Jesus Christ your Lord. You've not repented of your sin. You've not confessed your sin. You've not embraced the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. You need to understand there's not a place prepared for you there. There's not. But you also need to know this, that it's not too late. I remember that one thief that was hanging at the side of Jesus under condemnation of death. And he said, Lord, remember me. On the day of his death, Lord, remember me. And Jesus said to them, to him today, you will be with me in paradise. There is room for you. And I just want to say to somebody here today, before I get any further in this message and come to a close, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, can I tell you, there's space in heaven for your mansion. There's space in heaven on the Lamb's book of life for your name. This stuff that I'm talking about today is not stuff that's designed for someone else and you've been left out of the equation. But all of this is available to you if you will turn to Jesus Christ. Confess your sin. Yes. Give up your sin and embrace Him as your Savior, your Lord. Yes. There's a place prepared for you. And did you know? That not only is there a place prepared, but there's a crown prepared. A crown. I, I, I count at least five. I don't know if it's five in one or one in five. I don't know if it's five separate. I, I don't know. I get surprised by the Lord sometimes. But I do know this. The crown that He has prepared is a crown that is imperishable. In other words, the moth and the rust cannot corrupt and thieves cannot steal it away from you. I know the crown that he's preparing is a crown of rejoicing because those who go and sow in tears will undoubtedly come again in rejoicing. I know it's a crown of righteousness for those who are cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. I know it's a crown of glory that never fades away. I know it's a crown of life for those that are faithful to the end. I know because Jesus said it so and he's not a man that he should lie. But there's a place prepared for me in heaven. There's a crown for me. Amen. But can I tell you something? That's not what makes it happen. That's the benefit. Yeah. Oh, I could preach for a while. And, I, and I'm not going to. But I could preach for a while about the streets of gold. Walls of jasper, gates of pearl. I could preach about the river that proceeds from the throne of God. I could preach about the thrones of the angels that sit around the throne of God. I could preach about the angels that day and night cry, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of God. Oh, I could preach on heaven. But all oh, that's the benefit and the decoration. But can I tell you what makes it heaven for me? It's the physical presence of my Lord Jesus. This one that I started serving when I was six years old. This one that I've served almost my entire life. Whom I've prayed to without seeing his face. Whom I've read of without seeing his face. Whom I've, I've known by faith and I've felt his spirit touch me and I've heard him speak into my heart and speak into my mind. Him who has walked by me who He's guided my steps on every step I've ever taken. I get to see Him Amen. face to face. Amen. I get to take Him by the hand. I get to look in His eyes. I get, I get to His face to say, Thank you, Lord, for saving me. I get to see Him. Even so come. Yeah. Lord Jesus. My greatest hope today, my greatest hope would be that if there's somebody here that you don't know you're saved, you're still a sinner. Well, how do I know if I'm a sinner? You're sinning. Sinners sin. But all righteous people sin. Not like a sinner. 
The righteous person, they sit they run to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to have their time of need. They go to the Father quickly. I don't want this anymore. The sinner sin. And if you're still sinning in the sinning business, you need the Savior. My greatest hope for you could be that today that you say, you know what, I don't want to be a sinner anymore. Lord, forgive me my sins. I'm giving up the sinful life. I want to embrace you as my Lord. That's the greatest hope that I have today. My next greatest hope today would be that when you leave this place, that you leave with your faith built. Amen. You leave with your confidence in God higher than it's ever been. That you leave with a sense of security that God is in control, maybe that you've not thought of in a long time. That you leave here filled with hope in the middle of a world that tries to crush hope. And that tomorrow, you're light. Yeah. And tomorrow, you're salt. Yeah. And you make a difference everywhere you go. Amen. May God grant us that. Amen. Would you stand with me? Father, I come before you in the name of Jesus. And I ask you, Lord, that in the coming moments that your spirit would brood over this house. Holy Spirit, that you would settle upon us. Touch in our hearts and minds. Lord, revealing to us our need, our shortcomings, and drawing us to a place of prayer where that we embrace the chains that you bring. Father, I would ask that not one would leave here today still on a life of sin, but they would leave set free. I ask, oh Lord God, that those that have been more informed by news agencies, would leave here more informed by the word of God and by their faith and would be more victorious in the way they live. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that, that even as this music plays and we wait upon you, Lord, that you would, you would draw if there are people that need specific prayer, time of prayer, that their faith would overcome their fears and their doubts and they would follow you and trust you Now everyone is just praying. The Spirit of God is brooding and hovering over this place. If you sense in your heart that you need to be in this altar of prayer, if you sense in your heart that you need to repent, that you need to confess, if you sense in your heart that you've let the cares of life choke hope out of you, you want to come and lay those cares of life down and embrace them. And I'm going to ask you while the music plays just to step out from where you are and make your way to this altar and come and stand and begin to talk to the Lord from your own heart. Is the Holy Spirit